Hello and welcome to Acme Science News Now. I uh, this is the very first episode of this show, and I have a very special guest. Uh, but before I do, let's explain a little bit about what I'll be talking to him about. Crowdsourcing has been around for a long time. The wisdom of the crowds is something that a lot of people have talked about forever. And with modern things, we have, uh, say, Galaxy Zoo or Fold It, where there's a lot of people helping to solve scientific problems. But in all of those cases, those problems uh, were in the form of a question that was being asked of the people. That's no longer the case, uh, thanks to some of the work that my guest, Professor Paul Hines of the University of Vermont, has been doing. Professor, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. So I was wondering, I, where did you come up with the idea of having the crowd come up with the questions instead of just answering them? So this idea that we had um, started with a conversation between myself and my collaborator, Josh Bongard. And uh, he's been thinking about crowdsourcing for a while. And um, his work primarily focuses on evolutionary robotics. And, um, you know, a lot of his ideas were trying to figure out how can I get more people involved in the research process. And actually, he was thinking of this in a very practical sense. There's only one of him, and he only has a small number of graduate students. Um, how can he get more people helping him with, with the, uh, the research that he's doing? And so he'd been thinking of how can we get kind of the wisdom of the crowds to, to help out with research problems. Uh, and then we started to think about what about like a design problem? For example, how do you build a, a, a wind harvesting ener or wind energy harvesting device? And, and then we said, well, what if you could get a whole bunch of tinkerers to, um, to build a design upload their design onto the onto some sort of website and have somebody else iteratively improve on that and uh, and then and then essentially crowdsource the design of something um, so we tried some some ideas related to that and at the same time I was working on a project in which we were we um, were beginning to think about how to use uh, data in the smart grid better so smart grid is just this idea of that we've got um, Lots of energy out there. Uh, people consume a lot of energy. We're, we're in, uh, meter it currently on a fairly uh, sort of month-to-month -month basis. Uh, Smart Grid is bringing that metering up to a much higher resolution. And in Vermont, we're actually smart metering almost everybody within the next year or so. And so what we're trying to do, started to think about is how could we get sort of the wis apply the wisdom of the crowds to the problem of energy efficiency. Um, and so that's where our conversation started from sort of wind harvesting to energy efficiency. And then, and then eventually out of that conversation emerged this idea of what if we started asking people to ask each other questions that would help them to better understand energy efficiency. Um, and, and so that's where our first experiment was with energy efficiency and that's where uh, we got the idea. It was sort of this combination of, of smart grid and, and questions. And the other uh, set of questions had to do with uh, weight, correct? Yeah, that's right. So we did an initial trial of our concept, which was essentially um, put some metric out there. The first one was uh, monthly energy consumption. So people would enter in their monthly electricity consumption, and then um, people would ask each other questions to try to figure out what might predict their energy consumption. Um, and that actually didn't work all that well, primarily because no one could figure out how to read their electric bill well enough to figure out what their monthly cons the electric consumption was. So, so that was experiment. You know, it, it was useful as a trial, the idea, but not particularly successful. Um, so we thought, what is something that everybody knows that we could try to predict in this in this method? Um, and what we came up with was was body mass index because everybody knows their height, pretty much everybody knows their weight, more or less. And so it'd really be easy for people to enter those data into a website and try to predict that. Um, and so that it was not necessarily out of an interest in, in obesity or, or, or anything related. It was more of that was a really easy thing um, to get going on for this particular idea. And it turns out to be you know, a really important problem. Obesity is an, a really important problem, medical problem in, all around the world. 
Um, but but it was that was kind of uh, ancillary to our to our research. We were really just trying to find some quantitative metric that people could predict um, that that would be easy for them to to access. So in the end, how good was the crowd at uh, helping to predict these things? Well, uh, in I think in the in the model, um, I think we were explained well over half of the variance. Um, and, and with, in the, the energy case, it was a little less than half the variance in, um, the body mass index case, our model explained quite a bit more than half of the variance. And, and we're not necessarily competing with the best survey models out there. Um, you know, I'm sure there's probably a model out in the literature that predicts body mass index a little bit better than this crowdsourced one does. Um, but what's interesting about the, particularly with the body mass, mass index research, is that we were able to identify things that are really counterintuitive. And so, so the crowd identifies things that are unexpected, that an expert wouldn't necessarily grasp, just as, you know, an expert creating a, a research survey. Um, and I think that's what's really valuable about this method. It's a, a way to get at things that maybe the general public understands a little bit differently than the way that professional researchers do. No, that that is something that was very interesting. I I remember in a bit I was reading about this it had something to do with uh, the amount of masturbation. Uh, I was a surprisingly good indicator of uh, BMI. Yeah, we we uh, were quite surprised by that predictor, um, and we're not even sure what to do with it. Uh, we. A debate about ourselves whether we'd even put that in the paper for fear that it would offend a reviewer and they would reject it. Uh, but but it, you know I think it does actually illustrate well the, the idea. The idea is that people often have a sense of of how how things correlate um, in a way that experts might not. And so you know that sexual behavior is related to obesity is actually kind of interesting. Um, and maybe that could spur some other research to, to go and investigate that further. So how are you planning on taking this uh, forward into the future? Well, um, in the next round of this, what we really, well, we've got actually one experiment that's already uh, in progress, um, and that's going to be going back to energy consumption to predict monthly energy consumption in the, in the city of Burlington. Um, and so in this project, uh, we actually have a, a formal connection with the, um, the city's smart metering system. And so we'll be, um, be able to get the data from the smart meters in order to see what people's energy consumption is. And then there'll be a community of people within the city who are collaborating to build this model of, um, that predicts uh, electricity, electric energy consumption. And so we're hoping that will kind of do some similar things to what we saw with BMI and um, produce some, you know, sort of counterintuitive predictors of electricity consumption with the in intention that, that it will kind of point out where are the easy things that I could change that would save me some money and, and maybe help uh, with environmental issues. Um, so that's the next step is to implement that experiment. And then in the longer run, what we'd really like to be able to do is to have something that, that takes it even one layer further in sort of crowdsourced science than what we've done. So right now we've got it, um, the people are producing the data and the people are producing the, um, the predictor, the, essentially the questions. Um, what I think the next step is to really try to figure out, can actually the people choose which things are interesting to study from the first place? Um, so for example, We've had several people suggest, well, why don't you apply this to diabetes or why don't you apply this to whatever? And so um, I think we have some, some ideas about how to try to figure out, make it really, really easy so that people could just essentially create their own experiment um, using a web platform and, and start it on their own. Um, so we've got a website reserved for this called IWonderWhy.net, and, and that's, I'm not sure if it's running right now, but, uh, um, but that's something that's in progress. And, uh, I mean, you can always just let the crowd decide what the crowd wants to help the crowd uh, determine. I, th I think that that's the amount of levels of abstraction there. I think we're trying to go, yeah. Yeah, well, Professor Hines, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.